says a for a product solvent solvents no proton on the electro it's good when there's no proton on the electronegative atom but i shouldn't understand what what they were talking about So when we're thinking about substitution and elimination reactions, we're going to consider two different types of solids. We're going to consider polar protic and polar aprotic. Polar protic and polar aprotic. Notice that we're only going to consider polar solutions. So that's not the interesting aspect here. We're only going to consider polar solutions, so we don't need to worry about that. What's interesting is whether it's protic or aprotic. Uh, what are the definitions of that? A protic solution is one that can form hydrogen bonds. Protic means it can form hydrogen bonds, and a protic means it cannot. That, you can tell that from the name. Remember, another name for a hydrogen is a proton. So protic means can form proton or hydrogen bonds, and aprotic means no protons. It can't form hydrogen bonds. You learned about hydrogen bonds in general chemistry. I don't know how much you guys remember about those, but those are strong intermolecular attractions. Hydrogen bonds are fairly strong intermolecular attractions. What does it take to form a hydrogen bond? You, you can form hydrogen bonds if you have a hydrogen on an oxygen or a nitrogen. Or a fluorine, that's right. But that doesn't come up much in OCHEM, so you're right. But usually you're not going to see, the only way that can happen is hydrofluoric acid. The only way you can have a hydrogen and a fluorine is hydrofluoric acid, which we don't really use much in OCHEM. So you're right, but we'll focus on the hydrogen, on the oxygen, or the nitrogen. So, a protic solvent is one that has hydrogens on oxygen or nitrogen. And an aprotic solvent is one that has no hydrogens on an oxygen or a nitrogen. Let me give you an example or two. Protic or aprotic? This is methanol. It has a hydrogen on the oxygen. Aprotic? Everyone agree with that? Uh -huh. This is acetone. By the way, notice, so notice that protic does not just mean you've got protons and hydrogens. This has plenty of hydrogens. There's hydrogens all over the place, but there's no hydrogens on the oxygen. So you're only a protic solvent if you've got a hydrogen on the oxygen. Protons and hydrogens on the carbon make no difference. This would be an aprotic solvent. Okay. Um, so you should be able to look at a picture and tell whether it's protic or aprotic. However, sometimes they're just going to give you the name. Uh, the names that you're likely to see, one name you're very likely to see is DMSO. We saw it already. And acetone? Well, this is acetone over here. Oh. But yeah, you might see that. D this stands for dimethyl oops. <laughs> dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, anyway, is this protic or aprotic? It's protic. No, aprotic. That's DMSO? No. DMSO. Yeah, I know. Is that the picture for it? Yeah, this is the picture for DMSO. Aprotic because the oxygen and nitrogen don't work. Yeah, this is aprotic. Oh, right. Because even though there's protons, they're not on the oxygen. Okay. It's really like acetone. So this is a, co a very common aprotic solvent. It's called D dimethyl sulfoxide. You can see why. There really are two methyl groups. Here's the salt, and here's the oxygen. Are we supposed to know how to name them, given the structure like that? Um, I, no, I don't think you would be expected. Uh, well, this is so com important that your instructor might just want you to know the name for this particular right. compound. But okay. you're not expected to necessarily be able to figure this out from first principles What's yet. What's it called again? Dim dimethyl sulfoxide. Usually it'll just be called DMSO. But you, you should be able to see that dimethyl sulfoxide is a logical name here. There really are two methyl groups. There's a sulf, a sulfur, and there's the O for the oxide. Uh, but the key thing is just to memorize that this is what dimethyl sulfoxide looks like and that it's aprotic. Um, there's also DMF, which I won't bother to draw. Anything, um, this is also aprotic. Okay. DMF um, is also aprotic. Okay, now in the book, it talked about how like polar protic 
solvents or something like that are better for nucleophiles that are ionic, right? But polar mm. aprotic are better for anionic, like they increase the reactivity of anionic nucleophiles. Right. Is that yeah, so let's talk about that. Con- but then, then it's like contradicted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then like in the, in the problem set, it right. kind of said the opposite, so. Okay. So let's go through what's, um, now there's a bunch of subtleties and details here, but let's just try to go through what the main important thing is that you need for the exams. The key thing is to figure out which of these is better for SN2 and which is better for SN1. The main thing we want to know is which of these uh, promotes SN2. A-protic is better for SN1. SN2. Well, let's see why that is. So let's say we have a nucleophile. Let's say we're trying to do an SN2 reaction. Uh, remember, what was the big obstacle to an SN2 reaction? Steric hindrance. That blocks the nucleophile. Steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Now we saw, now what's, one thing that could block the nucleophile is the solvent. So if this is in solution, it's really going to be surrounded by solvent molecules, right? It's going to be surrounded by solvent molecules. Well, if it's too surrounded by the solvent molecules, then the solvent molecules will get in the way. It forms kind of a salvation cell. So we don't want this to be too surrounded by th- these. Well, um, which of these would form a tighter shell? The one that's protic or the one that's aprotic? Because it can form hydrogen bonds. Remember, those are unusually strong intermolecular bonds. Hydrogen bonds are unusually strong, so the polar protic solvent is going to form a particularly tight shell around um, our uh, nucleophile over here, and that gives us a lot of steric hindrance that would tend to prevent the SN2 reaction. So we've explained why polar A product is better for SN2, because you don't want a super good solvent. You don't want a solvent that's so good that it tightly solvates um, your nucleophile. Okay, so that explains why SN2 is, uh, prefers polar A product. Now, um, let's think about uh, SN1. What was the big obstacle to SN1? So the big obstacle is stabilizing the carbocation. So if you have here, let's say this is our carbocation. What's something that could stabilize this carbocation? Well, one thing that could stabilize the carbocation is the solvent. Now, so what do we want? Do we want this to be very tightly solvated or not tightly solvated? Which of these would stabilize it more? Tight. Now we want as tight solvation as possible because that stabilizes its positive charge. Well, then do we want something that can do hydrogen bonds? because that's a particularly tight solvation. So now we want a solvent shell, but we want the solvent shell around the carbocation, because our big obstacle for SN1 is stabilizing the carbocation. So for SN2, you don't want the solvent to be too good, because if it's too good, it will provide steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. But for SN1, you want the best solvent you can get, because a very good solvent would uh, stabilize the carbocation. So it really is crucial to always remember the big obstacles. That really explains almost everything about SN1 and SN2. All the patterns for SN1 and SN2 come from the big obstacles. Steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile for SN2, or stabilizing the carbocation uh, for SN1. The key thing about polar protic solvents is they're really good. Because they can form hydrogen bonds, they're really good. Well, we want a really good solvent to stabilize a carbocation for SN1, but you don't want too good of a solvent for SN2, because that would block uh, the nucleophile. All right, so that, that's what's most important for solving problems uh, for, uh, for these solvents here. Um, let, let's take a look at the handout for SN1 and SN2. Do you have a copy of this? Do you guys have yours with you? Yes. Uh, I hope you guys I had a chance to maybe study and meditate on this in the last uh, couple of days, or if not, maybe you can do that in the next couple of days. So let's look at the first page. We've been oh, using it to do the problem, so it kind of is like Good. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at page one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so here we're looking at page one. Page one summarizes all the different factors that affect SN1 and SN2. So what we were just discussing was solvent near the bottom, preferred solvent. And here we've got that SN2 prefers polar A-protic and SN1 prefers polar protic. 
But not only that, it briefly summarizes why. It's always important to know why we have these patterns. So remember, polar protic, uh, aprotic would be no OH or NH bonds. Um, for SN2, the hydrogen bonds to the solvent would block the nucleophile. That explains the pattern. Whereas for polar protic, that's OH or NH bonds, you prefer polar protic because hydrogen bonds to the solvent would stabilize the carbocation. So notice that this whole handout is arranged to tell you what the pattern is and also what the explanation is. Because it's easier to remember the pattern if you know the explanation. And also, you might be required to explain that on the test. You really need to know what the reasons are uh, for everything. Okay. There's really a lot of information packed into this one handout. So again, you really take some time to really study and yeah. think about all those different patterns there. Okay. Let's, let's get no cards after this. Yeah. Okay. Um.